we're delighted to have you here uh, and uh, very pleased to be having this event. I know Nick in particular would have really loved to be here because he spearheaded the creation of CUBE, our Center for Urban Business Entrepreneurship, and he loves to attend events where he can express his well-earned pride in the way that CUBE has blossomed and flourished under the guidance of people like Executive Director Paul Gangzi, who is uh, sitting right here to my left, your right, uh, and faculty members like David Reese, who I see right over there, Debbie Bechtel, who is a little behind him, Jonathan Askin, who I see standing in the back, uh, these people are moving it forward and we're very pleased about the direction that it's heading in. And this event really captures everything that we're excited about with the development of CUBE because we created this center in part based on just our observation and recognition of how Brooklyn has become one of the entrepreneurial hubs of the nation, if not the world, and we're excited about all of the growth and development and innovation that is taking place around us in this borough, and we looked around and realized that we were perfectly positioned, literally, physically, to engage with and take part in all of this innovation and growth, and we wanted to seize that opportunity for a couple of reasons, partly because we thought it would help our students. We wanted to be able to train them to interact with these innovators and represent the people who are helping build this community's economy and also the nation's economy and to recognize what it means to help fledgling businesses develop, thrive, and grow, uh, and in some cases to start their own fledgling businesses and help them develop, thrive, and grow. So we saw a huge opportunity educationally for our students. But second, and just as important, we saw the opportunity to connect and engage with our surrounding community. And we want to participate in and assist the growth that is going on all around us. And we are really pleased and delighted that we are able to uh, help out uh, the various innovations in the waterfront and elsewhere that involve public, private, not-for-profit uh, ventures all around us. Uh, so. Welcome, we're very pleased to have you here and we're very pleased to be putting on event, not on this event. Um, third and finally, my task here tonight is to introduce the next speaker, Borough President Eric Adams. We are really delighted to have him here again. Uh, he was just uh, at our convocation event a few weeks ago and he, uh, uh, very helpfully for us, uh, and importantly, hit home with the message of how our incoming students should make sure during their time here that they really try to connect with the community, to reach out to Brooklyn, to experience Brooklyn, so that after their time here, they don't just feel like they've gone to law school, they recognize that they've gone to Brooklyn Law School and have taken advantage of all of the unique opportunities and experiences that that particular opportunity can provide. So we were delighted to have him here a few weeks ago to share that message and we are thrilled that he is back again this evening. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Borough President Eric Adams. Thank Thanks so much uh, Michael and I thank uh, Paul and Nick who's not here with us uh, and it's just great anytime you have an opportunity to come here to Brooklyn Law School and interact with the students as well as the faculty and the staff. This is an, an amazing uh, institution that is producing uh, quality attorneys. And this is an important conversation and no one can really uh, express the, uh, how imperative it is to uh, the revitalization of our uh, waterfront and the industrial aspect of it than uh, Andrew Kimball. Many of you uh, may be aware that Andrew played a vital role in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and now he is moving uh, to a new area uh, in Sunset Park and if you want to take off your student caps you need to come over there on one Sunday. There is one hell of a party that takes place every <laughs> Sunday over there at Sunset Park. Uh, but uh, our waterfront uh, is really, uh, there's some exciting things that are happening, uh, but it's more than just the building of new uh, buildings and, and apartments. Many of us enjoy the 
a waterfront view, when you think about luxury housing or condominiums. But in reality, um, Brooklyn in New York is famous because of this industrial aspect of uh, the waterfront. The, we no longer are building uh, or having major um, industrial components, building large products and large floor spaces, but we're still an industrial capital with great pro products. We can't compete with the uh, prices of Kentucky and New Jersey on uh, how much it costs uh, for waterfront space, but we have something that they do not have. We have the people. This is the mecca of creativity. You can look at Makerbop down in Borum Hill, Epsi, a company from in the Fort Greene area, or even Huge um, that was down in the Dumbo area. We have become the heart of what creativity is personifying, and it's our people. Uh, the idea of what we can do uh, by allowing the waterfront to take a turn in the new generation of what it's going to look like. Uh, and I believe there are three areas of focus that we must look at. One, uh, transportation. We have an overstressed uh, infrastructure transportation system, and we're not using our waterfront enough uh, to transport. Utilizing the ferry uh, coming from uh, Rockaway to Brooklyn into Manhattan is a way to further use the waterfront. And then utilizing the waterfront for uh, recreational purposes. Those of you who have visit, visited Brooklyn Bridge Park, you understand the great opportunities of canoeing or other aspects. We've met with groups of individuals who are bringing what's called the plus pool here that will be on the waterfront and allow you to use it in a recreational fashion. But lastly, the industrial aspect. And that's why we're pushing in the Borough President's Office to protect, protect our waterfront industrial zones, but it's because it's important to bring middle class and blue collar jobs to the borough. It's about looking at the large number of unemployment. We're still dealing with a double digit unemployment crisis here in the, in the borough. And if we don't have an in, infusion of middle class jobs, uh, we won't continue to ensure the popularity of this brand turn to prosperity. Everybody's not gonna go to law school. Some people are going to have to fix your cars and be your legal secretaries and be the middle class economy that stabilizes a community. And so nothing feeds more into this conversation than a waterfront. Lastly, uh, one of my favorite books is The Power Broker, uh, Robert Moses. Uh, Robert Moses built bridges across Long Island to prevent buses from traveling to Long Island so you couldn't integrate Long Island. That same form of discrimination is done through uh, broadband and high-speed internet. You cannot continue to build out the borough if you don't allow high-speed internet in areas like Brownsville and East New York. Companies are not going to go to communities and bring employment if they can't ensure that they will have uh, internet capability and access. And so this is an exciting place, and I say it over and over again, and I will continue to say it to everyone that understands. No matter what you learn in law school or in any school, Galileo had it wrong. The sun is not the center of the universe. It's Brooklyn. It's Brooklyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Borough President. It's always a pleasure and inspiring to hear you uh, give your vision for this borough. Uh, and in particular, uh, your emphasis continually on making the Brooklyn brand a brand that works throughout the, the borough and in all of the neighborhoods. So we appreciate your being here at Brooklyn's Law School. <laughs> Um, I'm Paul Gangzi, and I have the privilege of being the executive director of uh, the Center for Urban Business Entrepreneurship, uh, the host of this evening's program. Uh, and I'm pleased to enjoy, uh, to uh, welcome you uh, to this event. Uh, and I want to say that you are a great crowd. Uh, there are students, faculty, uh, a host of alumni, and a cross-section of Brooklyn and New York City agencies uh, and, 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 and businesses. Uh, and I'm going to take this as a vote of confidence uh, for CUBE uh, and for uh, this evening and, and the year ahead. 
So before we get to the main event, let me tell you a little bit more about Cube. When I studied geometry, uh, I learned that a cube has six sides. Well, not at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, there are many sides to the cube at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, we're training tomorrow's lawyers to represent new entrepreneurial ventures in commercial, tech, not-for-profit, and public sectors. We give students practical experience through clinics, externships, and a Shark Tank competition where students present their own ideas for improving legal services and solving legal issues that are facing new businesses. Uh, we do uh, policy analysis. Right now, students at Brooklyn Law School are researching and preparing white papers uh, at the request of the New York City Department of Housing and uh, Preservation uh, to uh, create uh, solutions for, uh, for uh, energy retrofits and for improving the uh, efficiency of small retail and residential uh, properties. Uh, we're deeply involved in the community uh, through actions like a new CUBE consultation center that we've created where students and alumni together will go to locations throughout the borough and provide targeted consultation and advice to small businesses and entrepreneurs in, in different neighborhoods. Uh, so how many sides is that? I think I've lost count. Uh, but there's more. I'll stop here. Uh, you can check the BLS website uh, or talk to CUBE faculty who are here uh, tonight during the networking session. So we're very fortunate to have Andrew Kimball as our speaker this evening. He's a man whose career exemplifies the best of the entrepreneurial spirit that is driving the incredible energy powering today's Brooklyn. From 2005 to 2015, as the borough president mentioned, uh, he was the president and CEO of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation and transformed that 300, this is a place, you, if, if you have not been there, you really need to go over there. 300 acres, uh, which has been transformed into a center for uh, arts, manufacturing, uh, businesses that have come from all over the city to locate in this spot. And now he's moved around the corner to another part of the Brooklyn waterfront in Sunset Park uh, where he's charged with revitalizing uh, the huge industry city uh, complex. Uh, for decades, and I can attest to this, for decades if you drive down the Gowanus Expressway you would have seen the ads for the six million square feet available in Industry City. Well, uh, that's coming back to life, and uh, Andrew Kimball uh, is here tonight to tell us how he's doing it. So please join me in welcoming Andrew. Well, thank you all very much for, for coming out um, to hear me talk a little bit about manufacturing, innovation, and industrial transformation. I want to start by thanking Paul for his leadership here. Uh, it's amazing what, what CUBE is doing and, and what a great time to be focused on entrepreneurship in Brooklyn. Uh, I want to thank my friend, Borough President Eric Adams. Uh, much of what I've worked on over the last decade has been a public-private partnership and it's going to continue to be down at Sunset Park and I'll tell you a little bit of the reasons why, but very early on, and we've had many supporters at the Navy Yard, but very early on, then Senator Adams recognized the value of what we we're doing. And there are not many capital dollars to go around at the state level down in New York City. He decided that he was going to put all his weight behind capital allocations to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and help us create thousands of good paying jobs. So I think he deserves a round of applause for that. I <laughs> um, also just want to um, highlight two people in the audience. It's a great audience, and, and I know a lot of you from different places. But uh, one who I met for the first time tonight, Erwin Cullen, who uh, I feel like I've learned from, from afar because I've worked 
with and for many of the people who were his partners or worked for him uh, over many years, and he helped transform uh, so much in New York City, uh, Chelsea Market, and beyond. Um, and also Len Wasserman, an alum who, you know, over 25 years quietly uh, has single-handedly, always in collaboration, but without going through his desk, it wouldn't have happened, transformed uh, the economic development landscape in New York City. So Len is a real hero, and it's delightful to uh, be talking to you tonight. Um, so uh, let me just situate you, orient you geographically. Uh, Navy Yard on the left, 300 acres bounded by uh, the Williamsburg and Manhattan bridges, uh, bounded on several sides by residential communities, Dumbo, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Williamsburg, uh, and then Sunset Park, Industry City, uh, looking out right on, um, on the harbor, same view you see out the window here today, right across New Jersey, beautiful views back to the Statue of Liberty, six million square feet of space, on 30 acres and 16 buildings, very, very big complexes. Um, these were really the hub of employment in New York City and the region for many decades. Peak employment at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, 70,000 people coming through those gates every day. I met a few people uh, here tonight who talked about how uh, their relatives worked there. And it was, when I worked at the Navy Yard, it was every third or fourth person I met, oh yeah, my cousin, my uncle, Instead of six degrees of separation, it's always three degrees of separation from the Navy Yard. And Industry City, 25,000 people working there, peak employment uh, during World War II. But then, many, 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 many years of deferred maintenance, lack of investment, large-scale manufacturing going away, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, continuing decline, lack of investment in these buildings on the left-hand side, uh, you see what's being transformed today into a spectacular uh, 225,000 square foot green manufacturing center, thanks to some funding provided by Eric Adams and numerous other sources. Um, but when I got to the Navy Yard, the building looked like that. Uh, this is one of our 16 buildings at Industry City on the right-hand side. So at Industry City, really 30 years of no investment in basic infrastructure. So the 18,000 windows, 144 elevators, all began to decline, uh, and the place um, was not a home for very, very many workers. So let's talk a little bit about um, how these organizations are set up, what the management structure is, because I think it's, it's some of the keys to success. Um, so the Brooklyn Navy Yard is publicly owned land but there's a private not-for-profit that manages it on behalf of the city. It's mission-driven, it's on the ground every day. Every dollar that we made at the Navy Yard and continue to make at the Navy Yard gets plowed right back into the site. Uh, at Industry City, it's a private ownership structure. So the previous owners who owned it for about 30 years, the Schroen and Fructandler families, very good people, very smart business people. Um, but for years, as large-scale manufacturing declined, the it was very hard to figure out, frankly, what to do with these buildings. And like a lot of other privately owned industrial waterfront space, the thing that was there from a business perspective was storage. So huge amounts of our space is storage. We have a lot of city agencies. Men, most of our taxes are sitting in boxes there from the last 25 years. It's a little shocking. Um, but to their credit, about eight years ago, they started to see what was happening at the Navy Yard, they started to see what was happening at the Pfizer building, they saw what happened uh, at Chelsea Market, and they started to invest and cut up the space because that's where the creative class and creative market was, but then Storm Sandy hit. So $250 million of deferred maintenance became $300 million of deferred maintenance, and they decided they needed to bring in some partners, they needed to bring in some new capital, some new ideas, so they brought in Belvedere Capital, Angelo Gordon, and Jamestown. Collectively, that group then hired me. We've built a whole new team over the last 12 months um, with some aggressive reinvestment in the property. So how do you measure some of the success? Just in the raw numbers in the Navy Yard, and to be totally fair, a lot of this turnaround began during the Giuliani years, um, but then really accelerated during the Bloomberg years where there was public support from the mayor, from the governor, from the state senate. That leveraged over a billion dollars of private investment and 5,000 new jobs, and there's at least 5,000 new jobs in the pipeline. My successor there, David Ehrenberg, is doing a fantastic job 
uh, and he's going to leave an amazing legacy when he leaves the Navy Yard. On the left-hand side, uh, you see Steiner Studios and one of the sets being manufactured down there. So at Industry City, we're just beginning to take an aircraft carrier that was going the wrong direction for 75 years and slowly begin to turn it around. But it's been remarkable, the commitment of the private owners there in supporting the management team we have. So over $100 million committed just in the first two years in dealing with some of that deferred maintenance, upgrading the electric infrastructure. Just in 12 months, we've created 1,200 new jobs. We've leased about 500,000 square feet of space. We think that with our plan and partnership with the community, with the city, over the next 10 to 12 years, we can generate another billion dollars of private investment and 14,000 new jobs. So what are the keys to success? Obviously, you got to have owners. you got to have public partners. you got to have people willing to spend money. But you need to have a vision. You need to have a vision for where you want to take the place. And at the Navy Yard, we had a master plan, many, many iterations of it. But generally, we stuck true to what we wanted to do there with small changes. But we were nimble enough that when somebody like a Doug Steiner came along with an idea for a movie studios, we jumped at the opportunity. So that's part of being entrepreneurial, part of entrepreneurism. Um, city community partnerships. So it's not just about money from the city or zoning collaboration. It's about creating good paying jobs, right? We wouldn't get anywhere with the borough president or any other local elected official unless we were doing everything possible to create good paying local jobs. We did that aggressively at the Navy Yard. We're doing that at Industry City. Uh, and that's not only the right thing to do, it's not only smart politics, but it is very, very good business. Because if you can find a job for somebody who walks to work, they're much more likely to stay in their job more than six months. Um, then thirdly, and kind of the theme of the talk, is really the emergence of the innovation economy and what the innovation economy is. So here's how I define it. It is the broad range of making a physical, a digital, or an engineered product. So you look at the left-hand side on function, manufacturing, research and development, engineering and design. Any one of those three buckets has an element of manufacturing. Any one of the sectors that support that, and these are just a few of them, have an element of making a physical product or a digital product or an engineered product. If you uh, focus in on those sectors. Those are some of the fastest growing sectors in the city. Um, there's lots of discussion now about what is advanced manufacturing, what is manufacturing described by. This is a quote from The Economist that I thought was interesting. A number of remarkable technologies are converging. Clever software, novel materials, more dexterous robots, new processes, notably three-dimensional printing, and a whole range of web-based services. You can do now in 500 or 1,000 square feet what you used to need 10 or 20 or 50,000 square feet to do. You can prototype in a matter of hours when it used to take months. And that is what has changed the game in New York City and why it's becoming economical to make things again in New York City, one of the many reasons. Um, there also is a strong thrust towards uh, local food chains, uh, local supply chains, a sensibility about buying local, the importance of that, being able to see what's getting made, knowing where it's come from. That, that is a uh, phenomenon going on in the consumer world that is also driving uh, the innovation economy in New York City. Um, so this just goes to the sectors and some more numbers, but if you isolate the buckets by job code, of how I would describe the innovation economy. It's the fastest growing sector in New York City, far outpacing financial services uh, over the last five, six years. And when you combine all industries, and the only reason that all industries are even close is because the service sector and tourism has done so well, thank goodness, uh, over the last 10, 15 years in New York City. You know, traditional manufacturing, larger scale, smokestacks declining significantly probably not coming back on that large, large scale, but to the extent that it is, it's cleaner, it's more nimble, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples in a minute. One of the things that is exciting that is happening in manufacturing, and this, I argue with economists about this all the time, but if you look at the very narrow band that an economist might say is truly manufacturing, that is going back up in New York City. It's going back up slowly, but if you look at the last five years, it's growing, and that's exciting. Um, this is some market information from a study that came out 
Uh, about two and a half years ago, the EDC commissioned it because there was this dearth of affordable class B and C office space. So parts of Manhattan, like Midtown South, all of a sudden were exploding in popularity because the creative types had moved there, the innovation companies had moved there, the tech companies had moved there. All of a sudden, the community's cool, the hedge fund guys move in, kaboom. The real estate market's out of reach for those creative types. So they commissioned this study that JRT put together that I, I thought was really interesting and really mirrors what we've seen at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and what you're seeing in Dumbo, what you're seeing in Greenport Williamsburg, what we're experiencing in the Gowanus and down at Industry City. Um, obviously, affordability is key. The ability to have short and flexible lease terms are key. The willingness of a landlord uh, to take a risk on a non-credit tenant. So one of the genius things that the Walentises did in Dumbo was they were willing to fill up all their space with small tenants. They didn't particularly care about tenant credit. And because they knew there was so much demand for these small business spaces, if they lost one or two, there'd be four or five lined up to take that space. In fact, when they get a tenant that's really, really big, they get anxious. They're not crazy about that. They want to keep it small. Location. So not only is it cool to make things again, not only does New York City have amazing schools that are graduating people like Brooklyn College who want to do creative sector business, but people just don't want to go to suburban uh, commercial parks anymore. They want to be in the cities. And you're seeing this in San Francisco now in a very interesting way where all the creative businesses want to come back into San Francisco. So my brother-in-law actually works at Apple. He has to schlep 45 minutes to Apple both ways. Now, he's got a great job. He's not leaving anytime soon, I hope. But if that business was in San Francisco, wow. And that's what's happening. These creative businesses are moving back into urban areas. And then physical attributes. This class of creative makers does not want to be in the office building of their parents. They want to be in cool, open spaces. They want to be in buildings with good bones, industrial buildings uh, that have character, that are near the water, if they can get it. Uh, that are cool and innovative and bright. Um, and this just gives a range of the kinds of businesses that are getting attracted, both to the Navy Yard and Industry City and other creative sites around the city. So two very, very quick case studies. Uh, MakerBot, the president mentioned, really started in a small creative maker space, kind of a hacker space in the Gowanus, you know, our equivalent of Steve Jobs and his garage uh, by B Bree Pettis and some other hackers. Uh, I don't know when they started, eight, nine years ago. Uh, smartly, I learned on the way in, they hired some lawyers, some graduates from Brooklyn College to help them grow. Um, but they have expanded over and over and over again. When I got to Industry City, they had 20,000 square feet. They are growing to 150,000 square feet. And it is the model of the future. So they have 200 engineers that are doing coding. You go into their space, it very much looks like office space. Then they have 100,000 square feet of their manufacturing uh, and distribution and processing of their, of their product. It is the most incredible, diverse, well-paid workforce you can imagine. It, it just blows your socks off. It's what you want the future of New York City to be. Cry Precision was a great company, a great example at the Navy Yard. A couple of graduates from Cooper Union, they were designers. They wanted to design military products. They took 1,000 square feet at the Navy Yard probably 10 years ago, ago. They expanded probably seven or eight times. They are gonna be the anchor tenant in that massive hulking shed that I showed you earlier on, taking 70,000 square feet, growing to about 150 jobs. They decided they didn't wanna outsource the manufacturing anymore. They wanted to see it being made. They wanted to be able to watch it from a quality control control process. They were concerned um, about IP, intellectual property issues, so they wanted to be right on top of it. They didn't want to send it to China. I think MakerBot would probably say the same thing. Um, and they're expanding rapidly and will take 70,000 square feet of new space in the Navy Yard very soon. So then we talk about jobs. The borough president mentioned the critical importance of this, and I think this really is the hope for the future of New York City in moving people into the middle class, up the economic ladder. Those of you who know, it is very hard to get a job in retail, in the service sector, a hotel, McDonald's, and move up the economic ladder. It's, it's called cycling down, right? Inflation grows faster than your wages grow. The beauty of these kinds of innovation businesses is you can start uh, at the lowest level with only a GED, in some cases not even a GED, 
typically these businesses do not want you trained by some government program. They want you to come in, they want to make sure you're going to show up, and they want to train you on site, on the job training. The single best government program that I've seen in the 15 years doing this is on the job training money. You give companies a subsidy for six months while they're trying out the, their employee, and then they decide whether they keep them or not. Nine times out of 10, uh, they keep them. And you can see that there is a wide range of education levels going all the way up to research and development experts. Um, and that is something the city also needs to focus on. And I learned this through my work in the Brooklyn Tech Triangle study. There is a real disconnect between the universities and what digital media companies need here, and coding skills in particular. And there wasn't even that much collaboration going on. I think that's changed dramatically over the last two or three years. And I think Cornell Technion will play a role in this. I think CUSP will play a role in this. And we hope academic to be a big part of our development plans down in Industry City. But this is the job story. Um, somebody mentioned on the way in the Brooklyn College doing some work with the Center for Family Life. That's one of many of the nonprofit organizations that we're partnering in in Sunset Park. At the Navy Yard, we had our own employment center. We set it up. We went out and raised private money. We went from placing about 25 people a year to 250 people. 25% of those NYCHA residents, 12% of them formerly incarcerated, 12% of them veterans. Pretty extraordinary placement record. And we are trying to do the same thing at Industry City, but doing it with a little bit different model, recognizing that they're great local groups like Southwest Brooklyn Development Corporation, Center for Family Life, and others. We want to connect as much as possible with academic institutions to build a pipeline for entrepreneurship, a pipeline for jobs. So again, I, I mentioned Carnegie, I mentioned CUSP. I think the past mayor was genius at setting up the applied sciences. Uh, competition. We would love to see a similar competition around advanced manufacturing uh, come out of this administration at some point, and we would love to be the home for that. We are going to do lots of collaborations with universities, so we're talking to a number of them now about uh, industrial workspace, about research labs, but ultimately we would love to have a school, graduate level included, in some industry that's connected to the innovation economy, whether it's design, engineering, advanced manufacturing. At some point, we'd love to have a high school embedded in that, so you get the full pipeline of training. And the graduates of those schools come right to work uh, at Industry City, um, or even better, start their own business in Industry City. One of the challenges you're going to have at CUSP is, and, and, it, and it, uh, Car at Carnegie, not at Carnegie Mellon, at the at the uh, Applied Sciences uh, Cornell Technion, uh, which I think will be a fantastic success, but where are those graduates going to go? There have been, there are a slew of incubators now across the city that are fantastic. The previous administration set them up, the current administration supporting them, but it's really hard making the jump to affordable step out space for those incubator uh, uh, participants to graduate into. Um, some other exciting stuff that's going on, the Pratt Center has created this Made in NYC initiative that's really hyping locally made products. Uh, there's the Urban Manufacturing Alliance uh, that's emerged now nationwide that is focused on many urban areas and how to support urban manufacturing. Uh, and, you know, the White House has gotten on the bandwagon and started to throw a lot of money towards advanced manufacturing, many of them that have university collaborations. So let's come back to some of the economics about how you make this adaptive re or reuse of these buildings work. Uh, obviously, at the Navy Yard, there was a lot of capital subsidy that came from the city. We're not going to get that in Industry City in our properties. Um, we are going to need to figure out ways to cross leverage higher return uses to pay for the deferred maintenance, the $300 million of deferred maintenance we have, in addition to creating amenities for the businesses in those buildings and for the community. And the prime way we're going to do that is by creating some retail opportunities at the base of a lot of our buildings. So this is building 19 and 20 for us. Some of you may have heard about the Nets deal that we did. Not exactly innovation economy, but a great anchor tenant. They're going to build a practice facility on the top floor of this building, popping through to the roof. Kevin Garnett will be up there in a year and a half. He's still playing. Uh, two practice arenas, all their administrative support and gym support spaces, um, moving 70 jobs from New Jersey, visible from Manhattan and of course from downtown Brooklyn. 
Uh, we think there's a great opportunity along the base of that building to bring in some retail that could be complementary. So Hospital for Special Surgery is one of the sponsors. Maybe there's a health clinic. We'd love to have a sports store at the base of this building. Those higher rents will then help cross leverage the $15 million alone we need to spend in electrical upgrades for all of our waterfront buildings. That's just half of our campus, $15 million of electrical upgrades. At the Navy Yard, they're doing a similar project where um, retail cross leverages industrial, which I think is really innovative. It's going back out for bid. I think it's out right now, and it's, it's at Admiral's Row where a couple of buildings will be historically preserved, but basically they're giving the opportunity for a developer to come in, do a large format supermarket, serving the community. It's a food desert there. Navy Yard cross leverages that to create affordable commercial space uh, above in a really dynamic project. And this just gives a little taste of some of the many projects going on uh, at the Navy Yard. I really encourage you, if you haven't been down to Building 92, it's this small little exhibition and employment center uh, that, that I built when I was there that has an exhibit that really tells the story of what's going on. It's very interactive, very dynamic, very cool. Um, but there's an extraordinary amount going on from the Green Manufacturing Center to Building 77, which is that colossal building right along Flushing Avenue with no windows on the first 11 floors uh, that's had about two jobs in it the last five years. It's going to be transformed to a building that has three to 5,000 jobs to phase three of the Steiner expansion that will go up to the beautiful historic hospital campus uh, with buildings that date back um, to pre-Civil War times. So let's jump back to Industry City and the challenge that we uh, took on, the owners and, and management, a year ago. So we were looking at 6 million square feet of space where basically 73% was underutilized, 30% vacant and over 40% storage. Now, you can make a decent return on storage, but you're certainly not creating any jobs. And what we want to do over the next bunch of years is turn that on its head, take that 70%, do 70% innovation economy, 12% retail, 12% academic, and about 6% open space uh, and event space. And this just gives a sense of the massing of the complex. We have these beautiful finger buildings here that are between 3rd Avenue and 2nd Avenue. Relatively easier buildings to cut up. Massive amounts of deferred maintenance. We're doing about a $15 million electrical project here starting this month. Uh, these spectacular courtyards, which we are just have begun to activate this summer. Borough President mentioned this fantastic Sunday party. That's in the courtyard of 1 and 2. It's called Mr. Sunday. Check it out. Um, we do rooftop films there. In the first year alone, we've had 100,000 people down to various different maker events and film events and, and parties of one kind or another uh, just to get the word out about what we are doing. The big challenge for us, frankly, while this is a big challenge, these buildings, is not these buildings. It's 19 through 26 out on the water, much bigger floor plates, hard to cut up, massive deferred maintenance issues to deal with. We're going to have to take on 19 and 20 in a big way because that's where the nets are and that's where MakerBot's expanding, and we're doing that right now. But without the ability to move rapidly on the academic and retail front, it's going to take a lot more to generate the deferred maintenance resources to build out towards the water. We have several new sites that will be built to scale and, again, have a mixture of retail, innovation economy, and some parking. Um, so what are some of the challenges that we face other than needing money, needing some flexibility on use? Uh, I'm just going to highlight three of them. There are many when you tackle these kinds of big projects, but one of them is resiliency. Most of these industrial sites in the city um, that are struggling to come back to life are in the floodplain. The Navy Yard and Industry City being two of them. Navy Yard had about $100 million of lost inventory. Um, not as much uh, capital deferred maintenance. Um, loss as Industry City had, um, but significant. Both Navy Yard and Industry City exploring all sorts of different ways to deal with this for the long term. The smartest thing you can do is what we're doing, which is moving the electrical up, bathtubbing the elevators. You got to do that. That's step one. Navy Yard's doing the same thing. Um, one of the ideas we, we have that's a little out there, but it relates to transportation, and it's something that's being looked at in Red Hook right now, it's being looked at in Hoboken right now, it's been done in Europe many times, is building a storm surge barrier. We'd love to combine that 
with an expansion of the Greenway down to Sunset Park, linking it to Pierce Park, which is a new park that's going to be opening up down there, um, that is a double win. It's a Highline-like intervention. It gets people down there to work. It becomes a great amenity for the community, and it creates storm surge resiliency. Uh, the next one I'll mention is transportation. Um, this is huge for Brooklyn right now. Uh, Industry City has much better transportation than the Navy Yard. It's got the NR and the D. It's only a half an hour from Manhattan. Um, but it is very hard to move up and down the waterfront. So if you look from Long Island City to Sunset Park, you have this explosion of innovation economy jobs, but it is very hard to get from one place to the other. So we've been talking to a number of creative businesses that are looking to move down and take space, and they're like, well, how do we get there? We've got to take the subway into Manhattan, then we've got to come back out. Could we do rapid bus transit? I think looking at rapid bus transit, looking at ferry service, looking at uh, light rail again. I know it's been looked at many times, but I think it should be looked at again. Um, continuing the aggressive expansion of bike lanes. And just yesterday, I heard for the first time, somebody has the idea for a gondola. So I thought I'd throw that in, kind of interesting. One of the other big challenges is basic public infrastructure investments. You look at North Brooklyn, Navy Yard, Dumbo, up to Greenpoint, Williamsburg, you have a vacancy rate that in some areas is less than 1%. I think overall commercial vacancy in Brooklyn right now is about 4%. Um, you look at the Navy Yard, 99% occupancy with a waiting list of 100 businesses trying to come in. You look up in Greenpoint, Williamsburg, where Jed Willennis is gonna add 600,000 square feet of creative commercial space to meet the demand up there. And so what's the difference down in the red area? So 11 million square feet of space, less than 5% vacancy, 25 million square feet of space around Red Hook and into Sunset Park, in some places close to a 30% vacancy. The big difference is lack of public infrastructure. I'm just talking about the basics, roads, stormwater runoff, bike lanes. Those are transformative investments um, that can really make a big difference. And then the last thing I'll mention is just some of the interesting dialogue that's going on right now about live work. Um, now, I firmly believe there need to be isolated areas that stay commercial, industrial only. Uh, and the Navy Yard is one of them. Industry City is one of them. At Industry City, we have the natural barrier of the elevated BQE that separates the residential side from the working waterfront. At the Navy Yard, there's obviously a wall around it. That wall is more symbolic than anything else. It says, this is staying industrial. That said, around those sites, I think there is an opportunity for some real cre creativity, for some upzoning, for the mayor to meet some of his goals for affordable housing, for some creative thinking about how do we uh, incentivize the owners of tens of millions of square feet of storage space from Long, from Long Island City down to Sunset Park to convert some of that space to high employment innovation economy space. A lot of those buildings are beautiful, old bone buildings, exactly where creative types want to be. And maybe you incentivize them by saying, hey, you could do live work in here. Or you convert your building to innovation economy, and in the lot next door, you can build residential. I think those kinds of things are really interesting to talk about. I think they create live work opportunities for Navy Yard, Sunset Park, other industrial only sites. And that has all kinds of other good public policy benefits, like relieving pressure on our mass transit system so that more people are walking and biking to work. So that's my spiel. In case I bored you, I have a couple of videos uh, that hopefully won't. Um, but Lloyd is going to tee up, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Good things are happening at Industry City. Along the waterfront in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, a collection of historic warehouse structures is welcoming a diverse, creative, and growing population of individuals and businesses to define its next great chapter. We're redeveloping a 600 square feet of space, making investments in the buildings and infrastructure that haven't been made in 50 years. Designers and architects, makers and artists, startups, engineers, and manufacturers an interdisciplinary workforce that is breathing new life into the historic complex, drawn to authentic industrial loft spaces, to a bustling food scene and locally sourced restaurants, and to the energy and excitement that come from being a part of an emerging and vibrant community. All of your neighbors are extremely creative. You part of this community, and it's very, very cheap. Industry City is the future of innovation in New York City.
Learn more at IndustryCity.com. The Brooklyn Navy Yard is 300 acres on the Brooklyn waterfront. It was one of the most historic naval shipbuilding facilities. Some of our country's most famous ships were built here, the Maine, the Missouri, the Arizona. In its heyday, during World War II, the Navy Yard employed 70,000 people. 70,000 people every single day come to work. That went as low as 1,000 people in the 1970s when things were really looking bad. But we changed all of that. New York City has been working to redevelop the Brooklyn Navy Yard, bring it back to life, recreate it as a home for good paying industrial jobs. What I have seen in the last 10 years is just mind boggling. A lot of local, state, and federal dollars have been poured into the Navy Yard's infrastructure to make it what it looks like today. What you have is manufacturing the traditional sense of making things, but it's being combined with high end design, with new technology, with art, woodworking, metalwork. Currently, the Navy Yard has 275 businesses, and we've created about 6,400 jobs. That's something that we all feel very good about, and with the help of Goldman Sachs, we know we can do more in the future as projects like Building 128 come online. Building 128 is really in the heart of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and by being located in a central place, it really offers an opportunity to revitalize the whole Navy Yard. We're bringing it back to life, historically renovating it, making it a pub for the new kind of manufacturing. Creative class driven. It's design driven. One of the anchor tenants that will be housed within the building is a company called Pride Precision. They're a producer of body armor equipment for various branches of the U.S. military. One of the other main tenants is Macracy. We're doing a project called the New Lab. We're creating spaces which will be shared by a whole series of innovative companies based around rapid prototyping, new manufacturing, and 3D printing. We're hoping to just become a catalyst that will spawn a whole slew of different types of economic innovation. We expect to see a mix of higher technology businesses producing more and more quality jobs. It is incredibly difficult and complex to get industrial projects built. You need a very, very complicated capital stack, as they call it, to bring together all the resources to renovate this building. But Goldman Sachs came in and is filling that last key gap. In addition to us providing our own investment of private capital, a lot of the value we added was accessing additional sources of financing that they could leverage and then getting everyone together to the table and making the project work. We want to do as much as we can for the residents of Brooklyn in terms of creating jobs. We're really proud of our employment center. We're on right out of Building 92, right on the perimeter of the yard. Living in the neighborhood and seeing the Navy Yard coming alive and having job opportunities. I'm just excited. For the city, these kinds of jobs are critical to creating stable middle class communities. Brooklyn is the place to be right now. Coming up, it's coming up. This great project really is a model for what other cities can do. To be able to provide a home for that is really, really exciting. It's over $2 billion a year of economic impact, so the positive ripple effect is being felt far beyond our walls. Uh, Alex Goldman just graduated from Brooklyn Law School. I think what you're doing is fantastic. And uh, I'm particularly interested in a topic that you mentioned but didn't go into, which is preparing for the next Storm Sandy. I think you've got some very interesting ideas, and I'd love to, to hear more about them. And I wonder if you are also advising the city about uh, some of the things they could be doing but aren't. Um, I, I'm not advising the city. Um, but um, I think there is a lot of creative thinking that um, the previous administration put forward. I think the, the new administration has really focused on this in, in a big way. Uh, I think, you know, number one has been protecting some of our flood zones where you have uh, residential, um, particularly public housing. So Red Hook, as an example, has been one of the key focuses, uh, both for the mayor and the governor. Um, and interestingly, and they're exploring all sorts of ideas, but one of them that they've looked at is a, a storm surge barrier uh, combined with bike lane. Um, so that is one idea that's out there. Again, it may never happen. Um, again, I think the basics that you have to go back to are um, what can you do in your buildings so that they can take water in. So in our buildings, we had 20 million gallons of water come into our basements. We were essentially the storm surge barrier 
for Sunset Park, or at least a part of Sunset Park. Um, and, you know, by bathtubbing the elevators, moving the electrical above grade, um, that's going to make a lot of difference. Now, you know, the challenge is you don't know if the next storm is going to be two feet or 15 feet. Um, I think it was 12 feet at peak, maybe 13. Um, so it's very hard to plan. You don't know if it's going to be next year or in 700 years. Literally, I've heard that number as, a, as an estimate of the possible confluence of things that came together. Um, and I think there's a lot of thinking, too, about not just threats from below, but threats from above. So, um, you know, flash floods and things like that that can happen. Um, I think a lot of it goes back to the public infrastructure um, and stormwater runoff. Uh, which is absolutely vital. Uh, it's vital to our success down at, at Industry City, and it's vital to other uh, zone A areas. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of creative things that have happened uh, in Europe, um, you know, particularly in Denmark and Holland and uh, other parts of, of Europe uh, with storm surge barriers, um, with uh, other kinds of resiliency uh, interventions that we should probably be looking at, but it's probably the best I can say. Anything else? Hi, I'm Gregory Kimball. I'm a 1L here at the school. Oh, good. cool. Um, I had a question. You spoke a little bit about um, bringing like education into the project to be able to train. Um, I know there's a school in Brooklyn, uh, the name of the school P I can't think of. Um, I'm sorry? The P-TECH school? Is that the one that with IBM? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, is it in a similar fashion where you'd be working in part with a high school and kids that graduate from the high school may be get like two years of guaranteed employment right. or is that the same type of model you're looking for? Yeah, I'm not sure we have an exact model. We have a vision. Um, and, you know, PTAC is a great model out there. Uh, Automotive High School on the Upper East Side is an extraordinary place. If you've never been there before, you got to check it out where you're learning real manufacturing skills, not just about automat automotive, but how to build solar panels. Um, and developing linkages between places where the jobs are being created and places where students are coming out of high school or maybe not even coming out of high school, but with some technical training and can get a good paying job that moves them up towards the middle class. I mean, that's what we need to be doing more of. So our dream scenario is to first, um, and again, we'll have multiple college and university partners within our campus, but to have one anchor first. Then I think the high school comes maybe as part of that, and I'd like to see it, in my vision, embedded within that university. So you have, you know, a, a collaboration between the university college and the high school. Hi, Charles McKinney, New York City Parks. I say what's happening with that uh, transportation corridor. Any, any real ideas about how to improve north-south transportation for that whole Waterfront? Well, I think you've seen a lot of uh, improvements uh, in ferry service, and I hope that you're going to see more of that. Um, you know, you have to massively subsidize ferry service, but by the way, we massively subsidize every other mass transit, so why wouldn't we look to ferry service? Um, I don't think, though, that can meet all of the need for that north south commuting efficiently. Um, I think you've seen a transformation in the landscape on bike lanes. And by the way, um, there was a lot of people worried about bringing a bike lane around the Navy Yard. Um, we embraced it. Uh, at one point, I think I can say this now, the DOT overpushed and wanted to make flushing one way. So we had to very carefully say that will be a disaster for our industrial businesses that need to be going both ways, getting to the elevated BQE into the community, and they backed off. Um, but that's now the most heavily traveled bike lane in New York City. And simultaneously, you've seen the Navy Yard explode in growth. So I think more public investment uh, in those bike lanes is absolutely critical. Does uh, that um, elevated flood slash green way, I mean, that's a pretty interesting idea, but it does separate your businesses from the water. 
right? Is that hurt? I don't think so, and I think it'll partly get them to the water because by hopping on that thing at any different point, it takes you right down to the water. I don't know if you noticed in the map, but it, it gets you right down to Pierce Park, which is this beautiful new park that's going to be opening up in Sunset Park in some point in the next few months. Uh, it's very, very difficult to get to. The streets are not particularly safe, so there need to be avenues, whether it's east, west, or north, south, uh, to get into that park. Um, but just going back to the bigger question of north, south, I think you know, um, bus rapid transit needs to be aggressively explored. And I really do think it, the growth is so extraordinary along um, the East River axis, north to south, on the Brooklyn Queens side, um, that it does merit looking at a very, very big capital investment, whether that's in uh, light rail or something else um, to quickly move people up and down that corridor. Hi, uh, Frederick Siegel. I'm a student at uh, Columbia in the real estate development program. Uh, in the in one of the videos, um, the Goldman Sachs guys talked about the very complicated capital stack right. that's needed to get these projects off the ground. And then you mentioned in your presentation that there's no uh, subsidy for industry city. So could you talk a little bit about how you're financing the project? Right, right. Well, sorry for the shameless Goldman Sachs plug, but hey, they paid for the video, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> No, they were great partners, um, and that building is a great example of the complexities around how you get these projects done. So uh, in that building, because of its historic nature, because of its adaptive reuse, it was as expensive as building ground up to renovate it. So we had to raise, and I'm going to get these numbers slightly wrong, um, but we borrowed, uh, I think it's about a $70 million project. We borrowed roughly $30 million directly. Uh, and that was one of the other innovative things we did at the Navy Yard. We had not ra borrowed a dime before I got there. But what we did was we leveraged our rent roll. We couldn't collateralize our buildings because they're publicly owned, city-owned land. Um, but I actually went to China and raised money through the EB-5 program, which is a program where foreign investors uh, who are going to get their green card, but instead of it taking seven years, it can take two years if they put $500,000 at risk in a project that creates jobs in a high unemployment area locally. And we ultimately raised, I think, $100 million, but for that project, $30 million through EB-5. We uh, did historic tax credits. We did new market tax credits through Goldman Sachs. And on top of that, we had to raise, I think, $15 million of straight subsidy. So a true public-private partnership, very complicated capital stack. Your question about Industry City is a good one, and it's why we need to aggressively add retail to the base of these buildings. And so that is a broad range of retail, and one of the coolest things down there, I think we've invented this word, but it's maker retail. It's really taking these innovation economy businesses that are making a product heavily in food and Chelsea Market is in many ways the model, um, but also furniture, glass blowing, shoemaking, whatever it is, where people want to make things locally and then they want to sell it right there. So we're going to have an alleyway running through all of our narrower buildings between 3rd and 2nd Avenue that we call Innovation Alley. And on either side, you will go by little mini factories where things are getting made and you can do retail business right there. So that's one category. Another category is other neighborhood-oriented retail. There really is no retail amenities for the people who worked at Industry City, and it didn't really matter before because not too many people worked there, but when you go to 15,000 workers, you better have places to go eat, you better have places for other basic necessities. And there'll be some element of destination. I hate that word because everybody thinks, you know, Target or Walmart, we're talking about you know, some larger stores, um, but that aren't going to dominate the campus and are needed and that people will travel to uh, from afar. So the economics for us, that's where we get the cross leverage to really drive the deferred maintenance and convert the upper floors from either vacant or storage to innovation economy. 
So I have the feeling that these questions could, questions could go on for a very long time, and I'm going to suggest that uh, we uh, adjourn to the refreshments in the back. Uh, Andrew has agreed uh, to stay for a while, uh, and we have, uh, I would especially urge uh, the students here uh, to make a point of talking to the uh, representatives of the various agencies. Uh, we have, uh, for those of you who want to hear more about CUBE, uh, I'm available, and we have several of our faculty members whose names were mentioned. Please raise your hands so that we know uh, people you can ask about CUBE. Uh, and we have one uh, guest here this evening who uh, has a special relationship and which I, who I would like uh, to say a few words, and that's uh, Erwin Cohen. Uh, he is a Brooklyn Law School alumnus. Uh, he is one of the early, very generous supporters of the CUBE program, and he is a consummate entrepreneur who uh, invented the Chelsea Market, which you've heard mentioned, and uh, it's a wonderful uh, food and uh, other supplies emporium in, in Chelsea and in Manhattan, and if you haven't seen it, uh, you should absolutely go. So, uh, but uh, Erwin would like to talk just a little bit about uh, the importance uh, and utility of a law degree in going into this kind of business. Erwin Cohen. First, I want you to know that Andrew has undertaken, in my opinion, the most difficult commercial development project that I have seen in the past 50 years. And I've been in business with each of his three partners. Andrew has undertaken one of the most difficult projects of, <laughs> of his career, and we should all give him a big hand for his good health. <laughs> I wanted to talk about my father, Cube, and our wonderful law school. When I became a lawyer in 1959, my first client was my father. Things were not so good in 59. And my father owned a small taxpayer in Brooklyn, in, in Long Island. And he was getting a mortgage from the Dime Savings Bank, I don't think that's still in business, at Eastern Parkway and Utica Avenue. In those days, the bank did not give you the documents to read in advance, like you have law cases, now you can read in advance. So I went with my father, and we went to the offices on the second floor at the Dime, where I used to deposit a nickel a week. And they handed me the documents, and I was sitting with my father. My father could not read or write English. And I reviewed the documents the best I could from what I learned at this school. And I turned to my father and I said, Dad, this clause is no good. Dad, this, you, can't, you can't agree to this. And I kept showing him all the negatives. And he finally leaned over to me. And in Yiddish, he said to me, the English translation, my son, so will you loan me the money? <laughs> I learned something from that, that my education and my training that I got at this school was fantastic, but there was something more to business. And with Jonathan and with the school developing the cube, I always compared that to my father. The cube could be my father. And I'm looking at all the students from our great Brooklyn Law School and I'm saying to you, take advantage of what you're doing here and use the cube before you're graduated so that you can be ready for what you will face when you get out of school and really use what you learn here and what you learn from cube and working with businesses starting out in Brooklyn, for the one thing that I think is most important. We have to, entrepreneurs are just as important in our economy as lawyers and doctors and other professions. And we here, because of CUBE, 
have the great advantage of seeing what's available to us in the future. And while we talk about doing great things in Brooklyn, there's a great country available to us. And we have to export what we have learned in Brooklyn all over the country. And I found that what I learned here, I was able to work in Philadelphia and Atlanta and San Francisco and in Louisville, Kentucky, and also in New York City. So please think about what you're learning on how you could use your great talents that are being developed here for becoming, I, I, my goal is entrepreneurs for lawyers. And Q will give you what I learned from my father, going into business, and take advantage of it. You don't know how great it is to go to this school so that when you go out into another life, that you'll be able to use what you've learned here and to develop. Develop business. It's wonderful. And you have the ability to do it. I love my law school. I really do. And thank you. <laughs> And with that, let's adjourn to food and drink. Thank you so much for coming.